as world powers increase the pressure and immediate ceasefire in Gaza, ITV News has been given rare access to the operation to rescue Palestinians in desperate need of emergency medical treatment. Qatar has pledged to save hundreds of civilians and has been evacuating Palestinians after they crossed the border into Egypt. Our global security editor, Rohit Kadru, was invited on one of those rescue flights, which have seen aircraft become airborne field hospitals. We saw the incredible efforts medical staff take to help the badly injured civilians, from a desperately ill baby to a woman who lost a leg and her grandson in an Israeli airstrike. In just a moment, we'll hear from Rohit in Doha and also from our correspondent Emma Murphy in Tel Aviv with the latest on the peace efforts. But first, here's Rohit's report on the rescue flights and a warning. There are pictures of the victims' injuries, which you may well find upsetting. Daylight disappearing. But this felt more like a new dawn than dusk. Because for everyone boarding this flight, their path led upwards, arriving in wheelchairs or on stretchers, lying in whichever position felt least painful. Or they were carried alongside the papers which confirmed there is a way out after all. In the air, a military transporter became a hospital. Some of its patients don't have long. Abdullah is one of them, bandaged and in pain. He was badly burned when his home was hit by missiles. It is a struggle to console him. Nearby, a baby girl named Lean. She's suffering from severe convulsions. Further along on the lower bunks is Isra, blinded in one eye. Doctors now trying to save her sight in the other. Isra, what would it mean to you to be able to see again? There is in every bed a story of loss and of hope. This night, this night, some, I, I want to be crying when I see this, uh, a lot of uh, 30 patients, around 30 patients. But I control myself to become, to, to continue my, my work. And as the medics make their assessments, it is Abdullah who concerns them the most. It needs advanced uh, care. It needs more another operation. We first met him hours earlier as he waited on an Egyptian airfield close to the border with Gaza. He was one of dozens of Palestinians trying to get onto the flight in the world's most desperate departure lounge, a row of ambulances, with patients like baby Hur, who survived an attack four weeks ago close to her home. She lost her arm, and her mother and siblings were killed too. Uh, only, only her uh, father is still alive, only, but all the family members died. Next door is Nawal, another amputee who fears her family will no longer be able to rely on her. Nawal was, was, had her legs amputated. Yeah, explosion injury, actually, was one uh, racket the one came the near her house. But man, I stay open. I don't have to stay open. I don't have to stay open. Back in the air, 
And the further they are from Gaza, from the bombardment, the better their chances of survival seem to be. Consider what it's taken for everyone here to get the help they needed, crossing one border, then another, and only now, emergency care at 40,000 feet. Touchdown in Qatar, and an important decision. Someone needs to be the first off the aircraft. Who here could claim to be in more need than the others? It's Abdullah who is selected. He's visibly in pain. It hasn't eased, but he's not alone. Far from it. Rohit Katru, ITV News, Doha. Those rescue flights gave injured Palestinians the kind of health care they can no longer get inside Gaza. But they can only help a small number of those needing treatment. More than 71,000 Palestinians have been injured since Israel's offensive began. Last December, Qatar agreed to treat 1,500 injured Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, with 18 flights carried out so far. The flights depart from Arish Airfield in Egypt, close to the Rafah crossing, before making a three-hour flight to Doha, over 1,000 miles away. Well, let's speak to uh, Rohit now. Rohit, extraordinary report. You witnessed the desperate efforts to help a few dozen of the most critically injured patients. But what more can be done for the tens of thousands of injured civilians who are still trapped, of course, inside Gaza? Well, I think what's clear, Mary, is that this conversation about healthcare, what more can be done to support and to improve the healthcare system is likely to be a much bigger part now of the diplomatic conversation uh, in this next stage of the conflict. Because the health care system uh, is collapsing, it's possible uh, that we could say it has already collapsed. So, yes, so many people have been killed in these attacks, but large portions of those numbers are people who might have been saved uh, if the healthcare system uh, had been more uh, resilient. Everyone we met overnight, uh, Nawal and Abdullah and Lean and everyone else, is a survivor here. But what threatens them now is the fact that they couldn't get access to doctors, to resources, to healthcare support uh, inside Gaza. And so now the pressure is on and it is increasing on all parties in this conflict and all their supporters too, to do more to better help, uh, support the healthcare system within Gaza. Rory Katru in Doha, in Qatar. Thank you. Okay, well, let's go to our correspondent, Emma Murphy, who's in Tel Aviv for us now. Emma, the US and the UK governments are strengthening their demands, aren't they, for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. How close are we to that actually happening? Well, there's no particularly optimistic signs this evening that we've moved an awful lot further. This morning, Egypt said that there had been progress made and it seemed to be that basically they'd got from Hamas their demands that people who've been displaced from the north would be allowed to go back and that they would be willing to discuss the prisoners they wanted to see released from Israeli prisons in exchange for hostages. But of course, Israel still don't have that list from Hamas of the state of the hostages that are held, the 134 that they still have in captivity. And that is a real sticking point. But the pressure is really being brought to bear on Israel from the UK, from the US and many other governments. President Biden directly intervened, speaking to the MAR of Qatar, as well as the Egyptians saying he wanted to see a deal get over the line before Ramadan. But that is incredibly difficult, especially without Israel at the negotiating table. I've been talking to the family of one of the um, hostages that is still being held today. And they were saying that they share the sentiments of many other of those hostage families in real frustration that Israel is not at that table because without them at that table, there is no chance of a deal. And without a deal, there is no chance of getting their relatives back. I also spoke to um, a contact in the British government who until the last few days had been pretty upbeat about the chance of a deal by March the 10th, by Ramadan. Today, they said they were holding on to hope, but they were extremely concerned that might not be possible. Emma Murphy in Tel Aviv, thank you.